a welcome to our time together this afternoon with our truly outstanding speakers to help us consider what better means, what it looks like, and what we need to do for all our transformations ahead. Welcome, everyone. And I think with that, I'm particularly honored to invite our first speaker um, up on the podium. Delighted to have Ian Davis, chairman of Rolls-Royce, also a long-standing client of Echoes, um, who brings with him just a wealth of information and experience, having advised the best organizations globally, uh, Europe, US, Asia, the world, and government departments and not-for-profit organizations, um, probably most notably during his time as chairman worldwide of McKinsey. Um, and Ian, I believe you're also non-executive director of a number of boards, including Johnson & Johnson, Teach for All, and also BP, whom we'll be hearing from shortly. Ian, please, can I invite you up to the platform? Thank you. I thought I was going to have to hurdle up there at one stage. <laughs> okay. Right. Ian, thank okay. you. Thank you for right. joining okay. us um, in conversation with, I think, many people you already know or who certainly know, yeah. know you. Yeah. Um, I thought there's so many things we could usefully talk about mm -hmm. and meaningfully talk about, but I think staying central to our theme today around purpose and transformation, <laughs> given that you chair boards, you've been non-executive director on many boards, um, I think it might be interesting to start with, from your perspective, what are the triggers for the thinking and the discussion around transformation? Is it economic? Is it cultural? Is it change in leadership or technology? And how do boards engage on this topic? Well, uh, transformation is very much a buzzword uh, of the moment. If anything, I think it's sometimes overused. It's, it sometimes seems to me that crossing the street is a transformational act. Um, some companies, and I do think uh, it is quite important that those companies are thinking or talking about or recognise the need for transformation. It needs to be quite specific. And if it's the digital challenge, recognise that. If there's a huge cultural or ethical uh, challenge, recognise that. But I, I prefer... Uh, transformational uh, subjects, particularly when executives are presenting to boards, be quite specific about the rationale uh, and the reason for transformation and some clarity about what you're transforming from and what you're aiming to transform to. And uh, I think a, a good board, I think if a, a, an executive team is putting forward plans for transformation, will make very, very clear you know, what the transformation is, why it's necessary, what the costs of not doing it are, and what the benefits of doing it are. One other point I'll make on that. So specificity is there's a lot of gap around transformation. It's going to get worse as we get with the increasing focus on culture and purpose. We're going to talk about that. The gap is going to get worse, even though the importance of the subject is getting greater. And that's a fertile ground, I think, not just for good communicators, but clear uh, thinkers. So I think absolute clarity around it. But what's driving transformation, the big, the big elephant in the room is technology. There's no doubt about that. I would also say the people side of the equation is underestimated. I think what younger talent wants from organizations is so different from what many organizations offer. That's what I call a slow transformation. Uh, some transformations happen slowly. Some need to happen very quickly. Digital needs to happen quite quickly within 10 years. I think transformation around talent propositions, that's purpose, that's social mission, that's more fundamental as well. So when, you're, when I'm on a board, I think about specificity or what do you mean by transformation, what are the plans, why you're doing it, I think are absolutely the fundamentals. And as you address it, again, staying at the board level, yeah. what do you see as maybe the communication pitfalls or challenges? And I'm thinking here particularly as you try to connect constructively with the various stakeholders, obviously employees, mm. suppliers, mm. investors, customers. Um, and I suppose within that, particularly if you're quoted, um, because there's a dollar sign behind it or a pound sign behind it, do investors perhaps get overemphasized in this journey of transformation when you're engaging with them? Well, they can do. It depends on the, uh, on the transformation. I think many companies, the investors are the dominant stakeholder. When you're on a board, they are absolutely the dominant stakeholder. I think your reputation uh, is also very important with the media. But it depends on where you uh, come from. But this goes back to, you know, the specificity of transformation needs to be reputation with whom. 
you need to be very, very clear about that. I think a good plan coming to executives absolutely deals with who you're building reputation with. When it's done well, the comm side is done well, in my experience, it's, it's when the communication staff, which may not, I'll come on to this later, be just the communications pre professionals. I think communication is becoming such an integrated discipline. It's not a specialist discipline. It, 20 years ago, it used to be PR, media, or at least most of my experience. Now it's what I call an integrating discipline that comes in. It works best when people with communication skills are fundamentally involved at the beginning in the transformational journey. journey. I mean, you're all familiar more than I am with the word narrative. It's a really important word. The narrative has to be strategic. It has to be organizational. It has to be financial. Otherwise, it's a fake narrative. It's not a real narrative. I think if people who have real communication sense with employees, with uh, investors with media, with NGOs, depending on your audience. If they're involved early, you can practically always see it uh, uh, seep through. It's like when you see a plan when financial people haven't been involved in the end. It just sort of looks odd, you know, it lacks discipline. So I would say early involvement and absolute clarity again around like, what you're trying to do on the reputation side. And, and just staying with that, from, again from your experience, when you're leading on transformation, is it two or three key board members or individuals with particular expertise, or is it a total board effort? Well, I, I think it's important. Boards don't, you know, management leads transformations. I, I, I think it's very important to understand what the role of the board is. A board doesn't, it oversees and encourages and challenges transformation, but the, the actual transformation plan it comes from the management, has to come from the management, and uh, it, it'd be most unlikely that your clients will be a board unless there's a crisis. Uh, also, we can come, maybe talk about that. So the board would oversee a trans If there's a transformational plan, they would oversee the key elements of it. They'd expect to have progress reviews on it, and they would ask questions. But it, I, I think if there's a genuine transformation going on, the whole board would expect to be involved in that. And I've never had a situation where oversight of a transformation has been delegated to a committee. Can do for crises, and we can talk about that. But I think transformation, if it's genuine, has to be a board oversight responsibility. But if there's a supposition that the board drives transformation, in my view, that's wrong. Management drives it, boards oversee, encourage, support, challenge. One point I think a board might do on transformations is if you are involved with your clients or yourselves in a transformation, be very clear about what you are not transforming. There are very, very few good companies that don't have some excellent strengths. And that's particularly true of values or history or culture. And there can be a temptation when you're transforming to change everything. You bring in lots of new people. You know, people go and wear suits to black T-shirts and ponytails, and people talk about um, it's, we're, we're transformed. Well, maybe you are transforming, but what are you losing as well? So one thing I always say, and I think a role of a board can be quite helpful here, is a challenge. Look, what things have we got to, got to keep? And many of you work with or for very, very proud companies, great histories. You don't want to lose all of that as well. So as a board, when you think transformation, what are you thinking? We're not going to touch that. That, that. Those are the crown jewels. And if there are no crown jewels, then you'll probably lose the startups anyway. Yes, yes, yeah. so. um, you've touched on reputation. Um, and I know when you talk to your, 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 your peers at Davos and elsewhere, mm. do you, is there perhaps a, a, a business challenge when it comes to reputation currently that perhaps worries you or you feel that business is not doing enough around, be it around trust or be it around engaging with society or is it something else? Is there anything that you feel, gosh, perhaps business is losing sight of certain things or is it just a question of keeping up with technology and, and, and so on? Well, I mean, business is obviously under a, a lot of stress at the moment. It's a bit of a bogeyman. Business is not trusted, and people talk about that, and there's a lot of talk about the loss of trust in business. And two points on that. There isn't much trust in anything at the moment, and there are very few institutions that are trusted. I think it's important the business doesn't lose its marbles in focusing on we've got to win the trust of people. I mean, can you name any institution? Maybe the army, the military, maybe the law, legal system, but... Most other institutions, and there's a lot of anger, a lot of resentment around in the world at the moment. I think it's going to get worse. And I think you've just got to, this is where wisdom comes in. You've got to do it. This is not the first time in history it's happened, and it won't be the last. And I think it's going to be a pretty rough five or ten years for reasons that we all understand. So I think understanding the context, not overreacting. And you're seeing a, a lot of really 
really flimsy stuff on rebuilding trust with people, which is people see it for what it is. It's not real. Um, so I think context is important. I'm not diminish, uh, diminishing it. I do think business is going to have to do a lot more to explain what it's there for. All this talk about purpose, I think, is genuine. But it needs to be real. But I think it also needs to remind people of what it's for. I, I would never have a narrative where the purpose was put only in social impact terms, for example. I'm, I'm a great believer in social impact. I'm pretty involved in that. But the primary purpose of business is to provide goods and services that people want to need. It is massively valuable. And if you go to Asia, business is admired and respected because that's what it does, often in a pretty unethical and not socially responsive way. But people who are poor see the value of business. And I think the first task is for business to remind people of what we do that is, is useful. That's one. The second is to do it in a very responsible way. I believe in what's called responsible, but that's part of the purpose. It's not the purpose. And this is where I think a lot of clear thinking and this is where people can help is really not losing the, the purpose of business is, is business in a sense, but to do it in a modern way rather than try and say, no, 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 business is really about X, Y, and something else. So I think my bigger worry, this may sound very odd in a funny way, is that business gets too defensive and forgets to remind itself and people you know, what they do. The plus side is you talk, everyone talks about, there's some very interesting research done in the Netherlands and uh, where the loss of trust in business is at least extreme as in the UK. And it, it told that 70, when they surveyed people who worked in business, 17% of empl business employees did not trust big business. When they asked, do you trust the company you work for, 68% said they did. And that's a good sign. So we need to just remember that. So, if you have the media saying all the time, you know, business not to be trusted, you know, politicians not to be trusted, guess what? But I think the, another key is to remind people of what you're there for and use your employees as well as ambassadors to the business. Thank you. I know you've touched on many, many areas that I'm sure the audience will want to explore a bit further. And um, if I can ask a last question before opening it up to, to all of you, um, is given that we have so many leaders in, in this room and, and also those very much in charge of communications helping to drive purpose and cultural change um, for their organizations and their clients, if you had one piece of advice, you have this extraordinary career you've, 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 you've observed, you've been part of some of the biggest discussions, I think, in, in, in our corporate history. Um, one piece of advice just looking ahead for those in the room, in terms of saying how to drive meaningful transformation, mm. what would that be? Well, you warned me you were going to ask me this question, <laughs> and I'm, I'm very nervous about advising people I don't know who know a lot more about the subject than I do uh, anyway. But as I look, perhaps I could just redirect it a, a bit, Sandra, and just say, as I look at the profession of communication, I think it is a profession, the importance of narrative and purpose, I do think, and I've been involved in this, I do think that you might want to think very hard about the career paths for people who are in communications or in developing reputation. I think it's quite difficult to develop the perspective. You've come up through a PR, media, communications background only. I think it's quite difficult to build the relationships inside and outside a company without a broader experience. And I've noticed when I've taught some terrific communications people I've been involved in recruiting outside is how relatively narrow the, the background is. Brilliant people, talented people. And if you believe my perspective, this is going to become a key integrative function. I believe the same with lawyers as well. I think good general counsel now is need to be a lot more than lawyers. They've got to understand reputation too. I would think, and this is looking 20 years out, I would think the development and career path for I think the best communications people is going to involve moving into other functions, strategy, for example, legal, for example, maybe even operations, just to get a feel of what's it really like to deal with that. I think if you can do that, you can get a much better perspective on how to be really great at advising or executing on what we're calling communications and helping with transformation efforts. More like the butterfly syndrome, being exposed to lots of different Yeah, I call it the billows. You know, you go in and out <laughs> and that thing there. But I, it, maybe it's just me, but I've talked to a lot of, pe a lot of the you know, best communications people. You, they've got very, very similar profiles, practically always in comms, government relations, maybe with sustainability response. Beginning to edge out, but very late. And there's nothing, you know, we all know that what you learn in your late 20s and 30s is what really shapes how you think and how your network is. 
Ian, thank you. Thank you. I know many of you have questions for Ian. Um, we've touched on lots of different things for you to explore further. So, if I may, um, open it up to very much uh, an interactive session for those of you in the room who perhaps would like to ask a question. Um, two things, if I can ask. Uh, if you can wait for a mic to come with you so everyone can hear you. Um, and also, if you wouldn't mind announcing who you are and, and, and where you're from, yeah. please. Thank you. Hello. Magic. Uh, Kai Peters, Coventry University. Uh, Ian, you said at the beginning that the elephant in the room is, tra is technology, but we kind of know about technology. The elephant in the room from a corporate perspective seems to me to be populism and how you deal with that. And my question to you is, do you have discussions at board level at Rolls-Royce or wherever else you're involved in on how to respond to Brexit, to Trump, to locations in which no doubt you're manufacturing things like Poland and Hungary, do you stay shtum and sit on the fence? Do you say this is insane? Uh, because whenever you see someone having a, a happy lefty liberal opinion that I like, you can see that that hacks off a lot of people as well. And so the, the question for me is the role of business in political opinion now. Well, it's a good question. I don't personally agree that the elephant in the room from a business perspective is populism. I think from a societal and business uh, 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 social point of view, it might be. But uh, I, yes, we absolutely talk about this issue. Brexit is going to have, I mean, the breakdown in US and China trade is going to have a massive impact on, on us. These are, but these things have happened over 40 or 50 years, and you get used to de uh, dealing with it. And I think every company has to work out its own uh, own um, stance on this. Take one example on Brexit. Um, Rolls-Royce has got a very prominent position in the UK psyche. It's one of those companies, for example, that every government wants to back up its uh, position. But you know when that pressure comes that you're being used as an instrument uh, for that. And is it your role to support one against the other when you don't quite know what the other people think. I, I don't have any general, I think you've just got to think this through very carefully. And also, we get a lot of people in the UK, for example, talking about Rolls-Royce and Brexit UK. You know, we employ 15,000 people in Germany. If you don't realize that. You know, our biggest customer is in France. Practically all our electronics expertise comes from Spain. So you've got to just, I think you've got to work out what's best for you as a company and decide if taking a position one way or the other will help or damage the company. So I don't take a lofty moral view. I think every business and every board has an obligation to think it through. I think on very major issues, I think the best thing to do is get a consortium together, get the sector or competitors with you and just say the view, of, which is what we've done, is we've taken the view of the aerospace industry in the, and we've argued it very, very uh, strongly. Same on US uh, China tariffs, which in many ways, for many of us, is actually bigger than Brexit, but we can come on to that. Thank you. Uh, Ed, please. Edward Beckham. Um, I think you will get a lot of people nodding sagely if you say one of the things that protects us against uh, reputational disasters is culture. Mm. But when you're sitting atop a company, chairing a board, mm. how do you understand what's going on yeah. within the organization what are the sort of indicators that you're looking for well it, it, it's a great question and i and i think boards really worry particularly as the frc the governance is trying to make culture a board responsibility which i find extraordinary i mean it, it, I don't think, I think a culture is a protection, but it's not a fail-safe protection. Any company, things are going to happen, and these days with social media, if something happens, it's going to be in the news. So I think everybody of any problem is going to have to expect to live with a reputational crisis. I think it just seems uh, 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 reasonable. I, I, I do struggle with this word culture. I think it's very important, but the reality of any big company is that it exists of cultures. Uh, if you take a bank, for example, uh, I'm not a banker, but let's just take Barclays Bank. I, there's nobody there. I have to believe that the culture, at least five years ago, in Barclays trading floor is different from the Barclays retail bank in the northeast of England, for example. I have to believe that the culture of Barclays Bank in New York is different from the culture of Barclays Bank in Hong Kong. So the reality is that all companies, they may, may have a culture, but they certainly have cultures. And the question is, how does the board know what all the cultures uh, are. It's an almost impossible task. So I think, yes, you should try and do your best. My view is you'll never understand it in the boardroom. 
I mean, you've got no chance of people coming and presenting to you to understand a culture. My view is that what boards are going to have to do is they're going to have to get out more. They're going to have to visit. They're going to have to take what I call the very high, high leverage, high risk areas of the business, which might be big, might be small. And we've learned this in the banks. And you've just got to go and talk to people. And that's the way I'm going, is to try and help you understand the different cultures as well as the corporate culture. You've got to get out there. And the other thing is, and there's no recognition of this in the governance materials coming out of the UK, governance code, any culture, any culture that's worth a damn cannot be changed quickly. And if it can be changed quickly, it wasn't a culture in the first place. So you're talking five or ten years to change a real culture. That's usually beyond the life of any CEO or chairman. So you've really got, then got the pragmatic point about how do you make an enduring culture, in which case given technology, the, the governance people were saying, well, now you need another culture. I personally am quite attracted to the idea of what I call shallow cultures. Um, and, and I think this is something that boards and management should think about is what sort of cults you want. The deeper the culture, the harder it is to change. The more powerful it is, the more value it is, but also the riskier it is. So if you look at the great tech companies of 30 years ago, who? IBM, HP, uh, Bell, all gone. Why? They didn't adjust. But one of the reasons is they had such strong cultures. What made them great made them vulnerable. And I went to a fascinating talk with some tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, and all this culture stuff, it's a killer. You build a culture, you're dead, because you can't adjust. So I think you've got to, even that's interesting. And from a reputational point of view, this is really scary stuff if you have no culture. But I think every board has to think about what sort of culture can we have, should we have, should it be shallow, should it be deep? Are we really talking about values and not culture? They're very different uh, things. And in the end, I've come to the view, this is where strategy, reputation, comms link together. You've got to match a culture to the time frame of the business. I'm looking at Jeff at BP, uh, all the companies I'm in are very long-term companies. That's because that's the sort of person I am. Uh, the cycle, the average cycle from you know, investment to money is 15 to 25 years. I would always have a strong culture then. You want that culture to endure. If I was in fashion retail or software, I would not do it. So to me, culture is something that needs strategic and narrative analysis in the same way as you would a business plan. And I'm not a fashionable point of view, but I've come to that. Because if you get your culture misaligned with your strategy and your communications and your financial capability, there will be a train wreck, a complete train wreck. I hope that's given you a little bit of sense on that. There was someone at the back first. Again... Be careful with these dangerous... I, I, I give, sometimes give a speech on dangerous words. Transparency is one, diversity is another, and culture is another. These are dangerous words. They're powerful because they're powerful. If you get them wrong, you can cause massive damage. Um, hello, uh, David Haslop, uh, Purple Acorns. There's a title to think about. Um, I want to talk about context. That's the question about context and timing. Um, Sandra mentioned the value that's been created in five to ten years of companies that didn't even exist mm. five and ten years ago. And let's just be general about it. They're the bite companies, mm. the atom-based companies of companies like your own, like the manufacturing industrial era. How does a transformation cope with the difference in timing between how fast a bite moves and how fast an atom moves and the balance between the two? Because one is innovation rather than transformation, and of course the two ultimately have to live together. Um, so a strategy and, and, and leadership based upon innovation and the speed of movement of the modern uh, sweat company uh, with high value shares like the Amazons, the Ubers that Sandra mentioned. If a transformation takes your 15 to 20 years, um, Uber will have come and gone and 14 Ubers might have happened and yet that's the context that you as Rolls-Royce have to have a strategy within. How do you cope with that context? Well, I, I think your question answered, your question actually begged the answer. You've got to think through the relevant time frame for the transformation. What can you do? What do you need to do? If you're in an industry that's changing very quickly and you cannot transform yourself quickly and that happens, you should probably recognize it. And usually then the best strategy is to sell the company or get out and just accept that you may not be able to do it. So I, do, I think that's my, the point I was making, is you've got to ma match your 
transformation to the realities of your company and the realities of the external developments. We're going to see it in fintech, for example. I mean, if fintech catches on, and I think it will, it's going to be a nightmarishly difficult job for the big corporate banks to adjust to that. And the question is, should they try? This is board stuff now. You know, can, can you actually do it? There's not necessarily a shame, go back to Champata, necessarily a shame of declining. So I think you've just got, the very question that you ask, I think is exactly the right question to ask. How can we do it? Should we do it? How fast do we need to do? And I also think you're right, is a lot of people confuse transformation with innovation. Um, innovation, if you're perpetually innovating, by definition, you're perpetually transforming in a sense. And again, there's a lot of loose talk about innovative cultures, transformation cultures. They are different. They are different uh, around that. And you've got to decide you know, whether to do that. I'm working in two companies I know where they've actually very thoughtfully decided not to be uh, innovation. They've decided to accelerate their pace of, natural pace of adaptation which is different again. They want to continuously improve because they've worked out, I think in one case, I'm sure rightly, in one case, I think uh, rightly, that the lead times for the technology is such that if they accelerate their pace of continuous innovation or ad so adaptation, they will get there without destroying what made the company great, including the customer relationships, by the way. We haven't talked about what transformation innovation does to customer relationships. That can be very important too. So the point that you're making, and I would reinforce, is you've really got to be very, very thoughtful when you use these words about what exactly we're doing, how fast are we doing it, why are we doing it, can we pull it off, what are the risks of doing it, and what are the risks of not doing it. Fantastic. Ian, I would have loved to have taken one more question, but I think right. we've, come, we've come right. to time. Uh, and as I, as I knew you had so much to share with us, please, ladies Thank and gentlemen, you. round of applause for you. Thank you. Thank you.